Okay, so today we are going to talk about cybersecurity. Uh, in the previous class, we talked a little bit about the architecture of control systems, how uh, different pieces combine together within a control system or an, or an autonomous control system. So let's talk about, as a cybersecurity engineer, what all things do you need to care about? So the first topic today is security goals. And there are essentially seven security goals, and I will write them. Availability, authentication, access control, accountability, non-deniability. Okay, so this is typically uh, 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 abbreviated at C I A A A A N. Okay, so C I A A A A N. So, what are these different security goals? So, of course, some of these security goals are something that um, you, as controls engineer, may not need to care about, but but it's still something that you need to understand and you need to know. So what's the first goal? The first goal is confidentiality. What this essentially means is you want to prevent unauthorized access. Okay, that's the goal of uh, confidentiality. So in real world, in day-to-day -day activities, what, what are the different ways by which you can ensure confidentiality in a system? How do you prevent unauthorized access to a system? How, how do, why is it the case that I'm not able to check your email? Your email is confidential information. It's your email. You have access to it. But for some reason, I don't have access to it. I can't go and check your emails. Why is that? Password, password right? So you have password. Uh, anything else? Encryption. What encryption means is that you, you have a data, and you have a code, and you change the data according to the code. So for instance, you know, uh, is everyone familiar with encryption? I'm sure you have seen it in your financial documents. So encryption uh, allows you to change the data according to a code, and by using your password, you are able to decrypt that information. And so even if I have access to your email, uh, like the memory location of your emails, I won't be actually able to read it because those are encrypted information. So it will sound to me, to me it will sound complete gibberish. But only when you enter your password, it gets decrypted, and then I'm able to understand what's there inside the email. OK. So those are typically the ways to ensure confidentiality so that unauthorized uh, entities cannot access the information. OK. Integrity. 
prevent corruption of data. So an adversary wants to corrupt the data. How can you ensure that the data cannot be corrupted? Or if there is a corruption, you can, you can uh, revert the corruption of the data. How do you typically do that? Anyone, anyone did embedded systems coding before? So how do you prevent corruption of data? Or if the data gets corrupted, you are able to recover the data. You, you, have, you, have you used any communication protocols when you were working on embedded systems? I did it when I was an undergrad. OK. So everything that you did in your undergrad, you don't remember now? <laughs> no, 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 that's a real problem. <laughs> I, I understand that. Uh, so. So the typical way by which you prevent corruption of data, or if there is a corruption, you're able to recover the data is through what is known as error correcting codes. Or padding. Uh, or redundancy. OK. So padding just means that you add checksum or something like that. Checksum. So let's see what each of these things are. So imagine you have a rover on Mars, and your, your rover is capturing pretty picture of the surface of Mars, and you want to send it back to Earth. And this is a very long distance with a lot of electromagnetic interference in between. And you have to use some sort of electromagnetic waves to send that information back to Earth. So your picture may be of 100 megabytes, megabyte size. But what you typically do is you add a lot of what is known as error correcting codes. So error correcting codes, what they do is they transform the data in a very specific fashion. It could be linear or it could be nonlinear fashion. And they transform the file to say 150 MB, large data set. So every bit has been transformed, or certain bits have been transformed in the data, and more information has been added to that particular data. So now this information gets sent back to Earth. So even if 50 MB of this data is corrupted in the transmission, you can still recover the 100 MB of original data. Now, of course, in typical scenarios, you are only going to lose 20 MB of data, and you can still recover the rest of the image. I mean, you can recover the image exactly as it was captured. But in extreme situations, you could lose 50 MB of data. For instance, if there's a solar storm or something like that, and you can still recover the 100 MB of data and you can still recover the exact picture. So those are known as error correcting codes. There is an entire, the entire class called information theory and coding theory, where you study how error correcting codes are developed. But of course, we are not going to talk about that in this class. It's an entire course in itself, and a very fascinating class. In padding, this is how uh, there is communication within the vehicles. So let's say. Uh, you have pressed the brake, and the angle or, or um, the displacement is, let's say, between 0 to 1, and the number is 0 0.1. That's how you have pressed the brake. This is the magnitude of your pressing of brake. This gets transformed to bits, so 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. Let's say that's what the bit representation of that is. So these are not eight bits, seven bits. So let me add one more, one more term. I don't know if that is the bit representation or not. I just wrote some gibberish here. But this is the bit representation of this particular real number. So this is coming from a sensor. 
Um, and that sensor reading then gets transformed into bits. Now this bit needs to be transmitted through the communication channel to the actuator, which is the actual brake, which is attached to the wheel. And you want to add error correction part to this particular 8-bit signal. So what you do is you add, so this is your 8-bit signal. What you do is 1, 0, 0, 1, and then 0. You add an additional bit, ninth bit. And what this bit does is it adds the entire sequence of binary numbers and then adds it to the end of the uh, signal. So now if any of these bits are corrupted, the actuator would know that one bit has been corrupted. Now of course if two bits get corrupted, then that creates a problem because you cannot detect it. But if one bit is corrupted, you can detect that at the actuator level, or if zero bits are corrupted, you can detect that at the actuator level, and then you will allow the command to go through, or you, can, you will be able to cor correct for whatever has been corrupted, or you can request a new signal from the break, uh, braking sensor again. So this is known as padding, and what you are doing is you are adding a checksum. So checksum is the sum of this for checking that this information is correct or not. More sophisticated version of this is called hashing. Hashing is done for uh, very large files. I remember this now actually. Uh, that's called the parity bit, and we have in right. every data communication. Exactly. Uh, like in vehicles, we use CAN protocol. That's right. So that and CAN protocol so automatically adds some parity, of these things. Parity bit? Yes. And check some to like correct. make sure the data is correct. That's right, that's right. So that's what I was referring to here. So in CAN protocol, which is the, use, the protocol used in vehicles uh, or, and many other industrial systems, this is the way you communicate. So you have the original 8-bit, you convert it into a 9-bit or a 10-bit signal, and then you start transmitting that 10-bit signal. And so then you can ensure integrity so that if a couple of bits have been corrupted, you can correct for it. Redundancy is used where the sensors are prone to failure. So for instance, uh, you will have four wheel sensors, rotation sensors, so that if one of the sensors fail, you still have information. So that's called redundancy. You are adding more sensors. In the aircraft engines, you will have odd number of temperature sensors, uh, because if one, of the, or one or two sensors fail, you still have temperature reading from the aircraft, uh, from the engine of the aircraft. So in very harsh situations, you will typically add redundancy, you will add more sensors so that you can reliably ensure integrity of the data. So if some of the data gets corrupted, you can still recover the original data. Does that make sense? Okay. Availability, uh, everything is functioning normally. Functioning as intended. So this is one of the important goal for a cybersecurity engineer and something that we will care about in this class. So you have an autonomous car, it is under attack, and there is some intention, not intention, there is an intended functionality for that car under that particular attack. And we would like the system to do exactly that, which is what are the sequence of steps you need to take in order to prevent the attack from destroying the system. So there could be two situations, one is, there is an attack, you haven't detected it, is the system still going to function as intended? Now the second phase would be, okay, there is an attack, I have detected it, and this is what I'm supposed to do. Is the system still going to do that? So, so there is an attack on my braking sensor, and the intended functionality of the car under this situation is it should stop on the side of the road, not on the middle of the road, but on the side, on the curb. And the question then would be, is it going to do that? Is it going to be able to steer itself and 
go on the side of the road. So one of the ways by which availability is typically violated in the security system is through denial of service or jamming attack that we talked about in the previous class, in which the signal coming from one node to another gets jammed or gets dropped because of the adversary's action. And so then that particular subsystem becomes isolated and it's not available to do the computation or to do the function that it's supposed to do. Then the next thing is uh, authentication, which is more about identity verification, which has become very important nowadays. And of course, one way to verify identity in the earlier days, so 10 years ago, if I wanted to verify your identity, I'll just ask you for your password. You provided the password, everything is fine. Then people realize that passwords are prone to failure because you know most people will keep their passwords on the name of their parents or on the name of their whatever, things that they can remember easily, their date of birth and so on. Uh, so passwords were very prone to failure. So then what do people do now in order to verify identity? Sorry? Space. 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 Face recognition, uh, yeah, I think, I think, so in iPhone they do face recognition, that's right. So face recognition. I mean, I could, I could actually say biometric recognition because you could have iris scan, you could have fingerprint scan, you can have face scan. So let me just say biometrics. So in my phone actually it's biometric, it, it looks at my thumb impression to unlock the phone. But my wife has an iPhone and it looks at the face and it unlocks the phone. So there it's biometric. What else? I have one question. Yes. Uh, there are, so, uh, on many sites you will see there are security, security questions too. Yes. So is that for identity authentication or for confidentiality? Uh, right. So it's not necessarily a password, but it's a uh, it's probably an identity verification thing. So yes, yeah, so there will be security questions. So when I log into my bank account, it asks the security questions the first time I log in from that computer and then it never asks. So for some reason it remembers that this is a computer from which I log in uh, many times and then it doesn't ask the security questions again. So in some sense, my computer itself serves as an identity that this is from an authentic source. Okay, what else? So what do you do when, when we log into our university account? What do we get? A duo signal. Right, you have a one-time password, OTP, or you have a duo verification. So that establishes the authentication of the person who is requesting the information. Now, one of the problems in autonomous systems is this identity verification is becoming a big challenge. So let's consider the following situation. Uh, by the way, this was a very hot topic in automotive community a few years back, uh, but it didn't really go anywhere. So this was the problem. So I have a, ca I have a modern car, so not an old car, but a modern car. And it has maybe uh, so many sensors, so many actuators all over the place. It, it is considered a smart car, so it has a lot of connectivity things, Sirius XM and whatnot. And in order to have a smart car, we have to have a lot of sensors that are connected to each other through ECUs. And now each of them have to verify the identity that whatever information I'm getting from that particular source is actually the authentic source to send me that information. Because one of the examples we, show, we saw of the Jeep that was, um, the reason why that Jeep was uh, uh, hacked by hackers, so Jeep was in St. Louis, the hackers were in Texas and they were able to hack the Jeep, was because the information that the hackers were sending to the brake, the brake never verified the, uh, the identity of the source, like who's sending me this signal. 
And so one of the ideas was, oh, every sensor will try to verify the, verify the identity of the source sending them the signal. And it created a lot of problem because, you know, it's a finite bandwidth communication channel and you can't, like, there are so many 100 kilobits per second or 200 or 500 kilobits per second of data is getting transferred. You can't be verifying identity because that will flood the entire network with so many messages for identity verification. So, so that proposal didn't really do well. Then the second thing that people are trying right now is verifying identity through hardware signatures, which is sort of the new, new topic. We don't know it will happen in the future or not, but it's a technology that is getting developed as we speak. And the idea in hardware verification is suppose I have an ECU, uh, I have a hardware, and you might have studied in your signals and systems or in your controls class that you give a step input to the hardware, and then the hardware will have some signature like this. Right? All of you remember that from your signals and systems and controls class. So, so this input results in this output. So the idea in a hardware verification is I'm going to give it an input, and I'm going to see the signature of the output. And if the signature matches to what I think is the correct output, then this is authenticated. Otherwise, it's not authenticated. Now, one area where this is, people are thinking of using it is an electric vehicle charging system. So you have a charger, you have a vehicle. You could have a charger infected with a virus. You could have a vehicle infected with a virus because both of them are connected entities. And you connect the charger to the vehicle. And this is like a 480 volt or whatever, like 48 volt charger, uh, which is a very high uh, power charger. Like a DC pass charger is really very high power charger. So it could cause an explosion if the virus does something bad. Either it could cause explosion inside the car or it could cause a blow up of the grid itself. Blow up in the sense that the grid will become unstable and things like some of the transformers may get shot because of that, short circuit because of that. So uh, the way people are thinking is whenever this connection happens, in the first few seconds, we are going to try and verify the identity of each of the systems. And people are thinking about using these hardware signatures for authentication. We don't know whether that will be the case or not, but People are trying, and we'll see. Okay, so. Wouldn't that again be challenging? Uh, because if we are going to verify the identity through this signature, yes, it will again start. Uh, like the computer, the ECUs will again take some time to like compute this. Right, but in the electric vehicle application, it's still possible. Sorry, EV charging case because you have to do it once at the very beginning. And that will take two seconds, and that's fine. We can, like, if you are parking the vehicle for two hours, two seconds doesn't really matter. But, uh, but in, in like high bandwidth communication problem or, or like a CAN ish, uh, in the CAN bus, this is becoming a challenge. You cannot really do that. If there is a restriction of 10 MPPS. That's right. Yeah, it's exactly, exactly. Okay, any questions on this? So these are the ways by which we authenticate. So if you look at books on databases and they talk about authentication, they are really talking about all these things. Because for autonomous systems, the way to authenticate is not there yet. Like how do you authenticate individual devices and nodes in the network? Um, so this temperature sensor is sending some information to the building management system. How do you authenticate that this is the correct temperature sensor that is sending that information or somebody came and put in their own sensors here. There's no way to verify. I can literally take out that thermostat, put a new thermostat there, and nobody will know in the building that I have changed. Well, that's actually a vulnerability <laughs> because everything is open. Actually, somebody can literally come after this class and change that thermostat. Maybe I shouldn't uh, record this part. <laughs> <laughs> That is a serious vulnerability in the building management system, by the way. Uh, and there, as you can see, this hardware verification will be so useful because if I change the hardware, the signature is going to change, okay? Uh, there's another problem with hardware signature for the automotive application. So remember, Ford makes a car and it sells it in the market. And that car can be used in Mexico, it can be used in uh, 
Puerto Rico, US Virgin Island, which is like closer to the equator, or it could also be used in Alaska, northern Alaska, which is like closer to the Arctic Circle. Or it could be used at the top of a mountain, like a, uh, uh, what is that, uh, Yellowstone National Park. Or it could be used in some very hot weather, hot and humid situation like Florida. Right? So the car has to go through all these different situations, environmental conditions, and the hardware signature is prone to changes depending on what situation is it currently. If it is at minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the case in Alaska, uh, the signature, the hardware signature of the resistors and of the ECUs will be quite different uh, in comparison to if it was like 50 degrees Fahrenheit in Death Valley National Park in California and Nevada. Okay, so, so then the question is how do you, like do you keep a, bunch of signatures, hardware signatures, or should you just keep one signature? Like, how do you do that? It's all an open question right now. But uh, know that this is an important problem that needs to be solved for the future of autonomous systems. And if you solve it, you must patent it and then make a lot of money and give me some of that money, okay? All right, access control. So who can change? Change what? So OSU is a complex organization, and uh, there is this building, and the building has a lot of components. And the question is, who can change which components? Can I, as a faculty of the university, go and change that thermostat? Perhaps no, right? I don't have that authority to go and change thermostats in all the rooms, right? So the question of access control is, we have to determine who's going to change what settings in an industrial control system, right? So you would notice that in movies again, because I have seen most of the industrial control systems in movies actually, not in reality. So in movies, somebody will swipe their card and then make some changes in the settings. Okay, the temperature should be this, the pressure should be this, and all that stuff. Okay, so that is access control. A high level engineer can change some things, a low level technician can change some other things, but a high level engineer cannot change these low level things, and the low level engineers cannot change that high level things. So this is, all studied or uh, done by the access control system. And the way to enforce access control is uh, you know, through those card swiping stuff. And uh, in the case of autonomous system, this is again becoming a problem because I have a computer, and that computer is controlling the entire building whatever thermostats and uh, air handling units and the air conditioning system and whatnot. And I put a virus in there through a Microsoft Word file. So I, I sent the, the building manager an infected Word file, and the building manager happened to just open the Word file, okay? And then that virus entered the, the system, that computer. Now that virus can go around, change the temperature settings of all the rooms inside the building. It can make it 80 degrees Fahrenheit, it can make it 20 degrees Fahrenheit, whatever. The question is, how do we, how do we create an access control so that the virus is not able to change the temperature settings? So now let's say, consider this situation. Anybody wants to change, if the building manager wants to change the temperature, there is a do authentication sent to that building manager and he has to press accept and then only the temperature will get changed. If that is the situation, virus alone cannot change the temperature setting. Okay, so it requires that do authentication. And so the access control becomes important in that situation. But of course, know that in today's world, in today's autonomous system, that access control is not there. That multi-factor authentication and all that stuff is not there. So a virus can technically change the temperature settings if the virus wanted. So all of this is done through access control and when you design an autonomous system, you will have to worry about this access control part uh, as part of your software that you are going to write. Accountability, who is at fault?
So how do we ascribe accountability in day-to-day -day situations? If you did something, how do I ascribe it to your, uh, like something bad happens and you have done that something bad thing, then how do I ascribe it to you? How would that happen in day-to-day -day setting? when that change happened, okay? What else? So how do you do that? We can take the timestamp. Timestamp, very good. Timestamps, audit logs, network logs, so whenever you design an autonomous system, by default, you should also have a system log created so that if something goes wrong in the system, you can ascribe the fault to something within the system. So if a camera said, you know, I, I think that that is a green light and, uh, and then there is a, so there are three cameras on the, on the car and two cameras say it is red light, one camera says it is green light and for whatever reason the software decided that I'm going to go ahead with this camera and ignore the other two cameras. And then a crash happens, which by the way has happened before uh, on an Uber car which was going on the road and it crashed because it wasn't able to see that the light. It assumed that it's a green light but uh, there was a car turning, making a left turn. So this is what happened in the Uber example that I'm giving you. So. So Uber car was going straight and it saw that, no, remember, let me remind, yeah. I guess it was going straight and it saw a green light and there was a car turning left and basically that left turning car and Uber's autonomous vehicle collided at the intersection. Nobody was harmed, but it was a bad accident involving an autonomous vehicle. And so the goal there would be that you create, as a controls engineer or as an autonomous systems engineer, you have to create a log which says, okay, this light said green, this light, this is the timestamp, this light said green, this is the timestamp, this other camera said red, and so on. And then so that if something bad happens, you can go back to the system log and you can look up and you can say, okay, this camera was actually wrong, so we need to spend more time training this particular software or this particular camera's output. And then there is non-deniability, which is you can attribute action to the agent later. So you want to, so, so I have this system log and I go to the system log and I say that, hey, look, this camera said it's red light. The camera cannot come back to me and tell me later on that, hey, look, I didn't say red light. I actually saw green light. But for some reason, somebody else went and changed the settings, okay? So, in of course, human systems, non-deniability is important. In automotive, not automotive, in autonomous systems, because everything is a machine, there cannot be a non-deniability. Of course, in humans, there can be a deniability that, hey, I didn't do that kind of thing, but in, in machines that won't happen. So perhaps the seventh thing is not something we should care about too much. Uh, but of course I'm, I'm speaking not from experience, but just based on my gut feeling. So because machines cannot deny what they did or did not do, it will all be clear through audit logs or network logs. Okay. Typically, this non-deniability requires a trusted third party. So here is what would, may happen. So you are driving, not you, but some company is driving their autonomous car, it gets into an accident. And then the autonomous car company says, hey, look, it's not our problem. The driver was at fault, which by the way has happened with Tesla so many times now. So Tesla has this autopilot system. People just trust the autopilot system as if it's autopilot, but it's not. 
and they get into an accident, sometimes even fatal accidents, and Tesla says, look, we are not responsible because the driver was not, at, not controlling the wheel. The driver was asleep or watching a movie or something like that. And they are able to do that. Tesla is able to do that, deny the, uh, they can deny uh, that their system was at fault because of the logs that they carry on their vehicle, okay? So they'll say, look, the driver was non-attentive and that's why they got into an accident. So, and, and that's how, you know, Tesla has never been harmed in all of these accidents that have happened due to autopilots. Okay, so in, in other settings, again, uh, talking about automotive settings, you know, you have these traffic lights, has cameras all over the place. And that's a trusted third party. That's a government entity which is capturing those images and storing it and all that stuff. It's a trusted third party. And so if two people get into an accident, they can go back to the trusted third party, which is the camera company, and ask them, okay, show me the video, and then they can ascribe fault to whoever was at fault and for that particular accident. So um, now I can't imagine in oil and natural gas, chemical plants, and all these other complicated autonomous systems, who would that trusted third party be? Okay, I, I don't know. Uh, but, but those are the situations where you would need trusted third parties to be able to ascribe faults to agents at a later time. And the agent may not be able to say, I was not at fault. Okay, so these are the different security goals and as cybersecurity engineers, you will have to worry about it while you are writing your code. Okay, any questions on this? The next topic that I'm going to talk about are different types of malwares that are typically used in autonomous systems. Of course, malwares are used more generally, but they can again uh, have uh, some effect on autonomous systems. So let's talk about malwares. So I have virus, worms, trojans, keyloggers, rootkits, back doors logic bomb ransomware Okay, so these are different types of malwares that affect autonomous systems. And any sophisticated attack would contain multiple of these malwares embedded in that software. So it won't be just one thing, it would be a bunch of things string together uh, so as to cause uh, cause the damage that the adversary wants to cause. Anyone knows what a virus is? No? Maybe it's the wrong time to talk about virus <laughs> during the middle of a pandemic. But okay, so here is how a virus works in, in, in biology. So virus itself is not a living entity, but what it does is if it goes into a host entity, which is say a human body, it starts replicating. So it needs a host. Virus, virus cannot sustain without a host. 
uh, which is why masks actually work uh, for that reason. So uh, this is different from bacteria. So bacteria can live without a host, but viruses cannot live without a host. Virus need, needs a host. So in computer security, a virus works in the following fashion. So you have a doc file or a PowerPoint file or some other file that I'm sharing with you. A virus would be a malicious piece of code that will be embedded within the doc file. And as soon as you open the doc file, it will start, repl it will start replicating itself. Okay? So it needs that host, which is a doc file or some other file that is required to uh, and, and you are required to actually execute that particular, like you have to open the doc file in order for allowing the virus to start replicating. Otherwise, it cannot replicate. So that is a virus. It, it replicates itself, but it needs a host. Okay. What about worms? What are worms in, 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 in biology? It's just some, some insects kind of entities. And they can replicate and they don't need a host. They are, like, they are like a living being in itself. So it just replicates. It doesn't need a host. So virus and worms are malicious piece of codes which will sit in the memory and it will keep executing some command. And how that command affects your control system or your autonomous system depends on what that command is attempting to do. So in some cases, the viruses would try to erase the memory. So if you erase the memory, the control system would not have the input that it needs to have. Um, uh, on the other hand, it could erase the log files, in which case the system would function normally, but then later on if something goes wrong, you won't be able to go back and figure out what went wrong because the log files were erased by the virus. So it's still unclear. I'm sure if you go to Kaspersky or, or, or some internet security company where they work on industrial control systems, you would know better what exactly are the different attacks through viruses and worms. Like how does that affect an autonomous system? Uh, much of this information is hidden from the rest of the world uh, because, you know, these are sort of called company secret and therefore nobody wants to reveal what happened if a virus attacked their system, which is kind of a shame because if nobody tells us what the problem is, we cannot solve the problem. So, so that is one of the problems with uh, internet security companies in general who are not willing to talk about what sort of what happens when their system gets attacked by some specific types of viruses or worms. Okay. Trojans. So Trojans are, they just, uh, they are just a surveillance tool. So they look at the current softwares. running and create backdoors. And I'll, of course, talk about what backdoors are in a bit. But Trojans, typically, they, they are just looking at the current set of software, so they are sort of doing some surveillance. And then, then they are trying to figure out, how do I create a backdoor? How do I create a way for the adversary to start sending commands to this particular system? So those are known as Trojans. So Trojans themselves do not cause harm, but what they do is allow others to cause harm because they open some sort of port for start interfering with the system. Key loggers, as the name suggests, logs the key, logs the key input, which is typically used for discovering your password. So if I log in the input, log the key input, then I can discover what passwords you were entering at specific times of the day. Okay, then the next is rootkit. So rootkits are set of tools 
used to gain admin privileges to cause an attack. Okay. So the root kits are very similar to Trojans. Uh, they don't really cause harms in itself, but they what they do is uh, Trojans would allow you to create backdoors, which is create a way to send remote commands to the system, and those commands will get executed. Whereas root kits will allow you to send commands that require admin privileges. So even if you have put the admin privileges in place, rootkit could be used to elevate the privileges of that piece of software through some means so that it gains admin privileges. Now somebody else can come and send the commands and attack the system. So you might say, hey, look, I have put admin privileges so nobody can actually attack this autonomous system. But the fact of the matter is if the adversary puts a rootkit in there and some way gains admi administrative privileges either by using a key logger and identifying what the password is or through some other means and then it can use it to cause an attack because they have they now have that piece of software now has administrative privileges within the system so backdoors are uh, software typically experimental software uh, that are still on the system. And you can still allow some access to the system through the back doors. Uh, typically what happens in in older days was you were developing some experimental stuff where you didn't do a lot of checks and balances. So you didn't check for password and all that stuff. You started executing the code directly. Uh, and then you left that software and you shipped it to your customers. Now your customers have the software which has a piece of code that can do a lot of changes but will not require administrative privileges. Okay, Because you, you forgot to add, remove that piece of experimental software from there. Okay, and then if those backdoors were discovered by Trojans or they created a backdoor, then that's it, you are doomed. Okay, your system will fail. Logic bomb triggers an attack when some logic is true. or when a condition is satisfied. So if the temperature is this and the pressure is this, do this. Okay, so that's a logic bomb because it's not going to do any harm to the system for five days, 20 days, 50 days, and then suddenly, some set of parameters will be met, some condition will be satisfied, and then it will trigger an attack. So the, the adversary has been in the system for 50 days. You just haven't detected it because it didn't do anything. But when certain parameters were satisfied, it just triggered the attack and caused a, caused a problem for the system. So that's a logic bomb. Difficult to detect because it will only cause something unreasonable when certain conditions are satisfied. Okay, ransomware. So what ransomware does, it encrypts the data and provides decryption key.
when bitcoins are paid. Okay, so the famous, the, the recently most famous rans ransomware was the attack on a gas pipeline in New York back in uh, May, uh, late April or early May. And there, what the hackers did was they encrypted the billing data, the entire billing software of the system. And they said that if you provide me with, I think, $90 million or something like, some obscene million dollars, then they will provide with the description key. And that, that entire money was supposed to be transferred using bitcoins. I think it was 90 bitcoins or something. So, so that's a ransomware. It will encrypt the data and until the money gets paid, they will not provide the decryption key. And actually, in, in the case of this uh, gas, I think, some, the gas pipeline ransomware, they said that the more you delay paying us the ransom, the higher the number of bitcoins you need to pay in order for me to provide, in order for us to provide you with a decryption key. So they actually paid the ransom within like a day or two because they didn't want the amount to go up before they could get the decryption key. So this isn't really a, I mean, so you can argue that this gas pipeline is an autonomous system, but actually the attack was not on the autonomous system itself, it was on the billing system. Now if you cannot bill, you cannot sell. And if you cannot sell, then there is no, like there will be dearth of that commodity. In this case, it was gasoline. And in Washington DC and many other places in the East Coast, they didn't have gas for several days. There was no gasoline in petrol pumps, in gasoline pumps, and, and it was really bad situation for a few days. So that's a ransomware attack. This has been very common in the past, uh, in the recent past, because for some reason, I have seen a lot of ransomware attacks in the past, but uh, I don't know if there is a way to get around it or not. Any questions on this part? So, so uh, ransomware and, and like logic bombs and those stuff, how does it reach the system? Does it reach it through viruses and, and, and worms or something like that? Or how did it get there? So viruses and worms, uh, typically they spread without understanding what that system is. So if my computer gets infected and your computer is connected to the same network as mine, yours will also get it infected. I think some of these things are very targeted. So yeah. I, I go to your place, I look at your IP address or something like that, and then I, I have a targeted attack at your particular system. It's not like it's spreading all over the place. And of course, how hackers do it is something that's sort of hidden from me. Like, I don't know how they actually do it, but I'm sure there are ways by which you don't create a virus and worm, you directly target a specific computer system remotely. Uh, I'm sure there would be some way to do it. That's right, that's right. People were receiving some malicious emails. That's right. And if the file they if they open that email, right, it will enter your system. That's right. And it will encrypt everything. Correct. And Correct. So that is what they were doing. That's right. And, and that was for general user like uh, you and me. Every, that wasn't every, for. Everyone will be Correct. affected. Correct. Like Correct. That's right. That's right. That's right. It happened in India a lot. Like That's right. Many people uh, had that issue. Yeah, yeah, it was a worldwide issue actually. That was a worldwide ransomware. And I don't know what happened after that. <laughs> For some reason it died within a couple of days because there were security people in, uh, in LA who actually prevented that infection to other computers. So they were able to contain the spread of that ransomware. So that's all I have for today. In the next class, we'll talk about some specific control system and some specific attack models. Uh, now that we have a bird's eye view of how things are carried out in real world. Thank you.